today's topic is range searching which is probably one of the most important uh, areas of computation geometry and also applications that extend to almost every area of computer science uh, namely you know uh, database searching and more uh, closely probably you know uh, geographical databases okay so what is it so there's a very general definition but let me not get into too much generality but just uh, give you a reasonable definition of what it is so you're given a set of points <coughs> in let's say in a in a plane uh, more generally in d, d dimensions okay. so given a set this um we are allowed to build an appropriate data structure that supports vary of the following kind for some range i just define what i mean by ranges some given range just a moment range of delta we should return with the two kinds of queries one is reporting query where we must return all points in delta intersection s or the cardinality basically number of points and what is a range a range is range is a uh, family uh, let's say predefined family predefined family of subsets of the euclidean d dimension right? okay so simplest case or let's say a very natural case would be uh example points on plane okay and my range could be let us say rectangle so this is a this is a natural query uh, for uh, database kind of problems so your 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 query range is a cartesian product of two intervals right so you could specify that give me all the points that have x um, coordinates between x1 and x2 okay and simultaneously between y coordinates between y1 and y2 okay so this is your cartesian product of <coughs> two one dimensional intervals and most common database queries can be posed in this way 
that you have points in some dimensions which corresponds to the attributes of you know in some high dimensional spaces. If I have 10 attributes, then I will work in 10 dimensions, okay. And then you have a query that you know give me all those points or uh, data that have you know x1 coordinates between this and this, x2 coordinates between this and this, x3 coordinates between this and this. So, that will be a hyper rectangle. So, a, a general query, okay. So, a general database query can be posed as a hyper rectangular hyper rectangle um, range query. And the most trivial example of the, this thing would be one dimensional, right. So, I have points on a line okay. and my intervals are closed intervals, oh, sorry my, my ranges are closed intervals. So, either this or it could be this etcetera. Now, the important one of the things that I have actually mentioned the definition, but it strictly speaking it need not be a part of the definition is I am I am already uh, I am already referring to a data structure okay, that build an appropriate data structure that supports a query of the following kind. And this is under the assumption that uh, you know there is not one query that you want to handle, but you know uh, a whole sequence or family of queries. If it were just one query, you know. Suppose uh, we were interested in only one query. Suppose there would be only one query. Okay. Then clearly, you know, the overheads of building a data structure, okay, is, is something that you don't want to bear. Uh, it's something that's not worth it. So what you're going to do is. What's the, what's the most trivial way of answering a, a range query? So, this range intersection S. So, I am going to basically determine for every point, okay, the trivial al algorithm will be for every point. So, trivial approach for every point in the set S determine if p belongs to the range right and assuming this is a simple constant time test right, usually your ranges are not going to be too complicated i mean although i have not put any restriction in the definition but mostly you know this test okay usually it's a constant time test okay, and if that is so then for any kind of natural range query problem, you can provide the answer in order n time. Just check out every point with respect to that given range whether or not it belongs to the range or not, right. So, order n trivial algorithm and it does not really require you to build any databases, uh, sorry any data structures. But the problem becomes interesting once you know we go beyond this one query or a few queries things that you know there could be a large number of queries you know perhaps millions of queries or it is just a, like a continuous process where you get this query. So, for multiple queries, queries it makes sense. to build a data structure so that the overheads of construction is justified and we can 
return the answers quickly. Quickly meaning not like order n time, it is something fast, hopefully something polylogarithmic, but there is a catch, but then you know we are used to this model now. Uh, so, there are these two kinds of queries right that uh, all points. So, one is the reporting query. So, this is the reporting query where I am supposed to report or produce as, a, as an output all those points that lie in this range. The other one is the counting query okay. and by now you are used to the fact that in the reporting query the minimum time should be at least the size of the answer or the output. In the case of number of points that becomes much simpler it is you know some some number between 1 and n that is much simpler, but then in the in the type 1 kind of query which is the usual kind of the more common kind of query uh, there would be some kind of additive thing. So, it is not that ideally we would like to report it in time proportional to the number of points in the uh, range, but then um, you do encounter some fixed term and that fixed term is usually a polylogarithmic term. Okay. So, ideal kind of bound for range query. Okay. So, this quickly, uh, so for reporting we mean let us say about order some polylog plus output size and in the counting we would expect some polylog. So, this is basically the objective when we build a data structure right. and also almost equally important is the what is the other parameter the size of the data structure correct right okay the other thing is the size of the data structure okay and somewhat less important is the pre processing time okay. so so with this in place these definitions in place let's let's see what we can do with this this uh, okay i already do this picture so, for points on a line okay, and the ranges are intervals, okay. let me shift to the other one. So, the simplest case probably. Points on line and ranges are closed intervals. Okay, this is my given set of points and at any point of time I could be given okay what is report all the points between you know uh, x 1 to x 2. it could be any kind of interval or this one you know, could be this one. So, how would you solve this problem? Yeah, yeah that is just looks rather simple. So, you, you you must basically locate your left uh, left boundary of the interval okay. and if you have kept this point sorted. So, the essentially what you are doing is sorting the so pre processing is sort the points right and query answering is locate the left boundary using binary search okay and start walking basically right start traversing uh, and outputting until you reach the right boundary right so if it is this one I locate this one in using uh, a binary search 
and then output this, output this, output this, then I find that I have reached the right boundary and that is the end of it. So, what is the query processing time here? Right. So, login for the binary search plus the output size, right. So, that is your ideal bound of login plus output size, sorting the points. Let us say if you use the comparison sort and log in and your data structure size is nothing but a sorted list order n, right. So, all these figures are exactly what you want it to be. So, okay, one dimensional problem usually are much simpler. It is time to graduate to the next dimension. Okay. So, there is maybe one more variation I, sh I should just mention. Uh, so, all is fine till now, but what happens if we also have this provision that points can be deleted or inserted? Exactly. Okay. So, in the in the one dimensional case, so let me just write it here. <coughs> Further variation or natural variation on these. So, range searching problem. May have this following variation, which is very natural variation. One is the static case. Okay. The other was is the dynamic case where the underlying point set can change. And in the case of one dimension, even if the change as someone suggested instead of a, a sorted array or something, you just go and do your some favorite you know balanced tree structures okay which supports insertions and deletions and that's it so all your bounds remain unchanged asymptotically you still have order in space you still have order log n plus uh, output size query time and uh, in addition the other parameters are what is the time to insert and modify the data structure right the mod so moment you have this then the additional parameters basically another important parameter is time to update the data structure. So, this one also should be ideally you know, some polylog is what we should be aiming for. For each point inserted or deleted, I do not want to incur too much cost in modifying the underlying data structure. And in the case of one dimension, again this is order log n, right? So, insert point, delete point everything is order log. So, in one dimension we have everything ideal you know whatever we we can hope for. Okay. Does the same thing happen when we go to higher dimension. Okay. Okay, the higher, once we move to higher dimension that is 2 or more. There are actually two things that happen. One is, in the case of one dimension, what are the what are the other kinds of ranges you can think of? I mean, the the kind of ranges we dealt with are interval ranges, right? The subsets that are queries. And uh, if I mean, I, I didn't say it explicitly, but clearly the data structure that you have you have designed should depend on the kind of ranges you are supposed to handle, right? So you built this data structure that whatever sorted set or a balanced uh, balanced tree uh, assuming that my query ranges are going to be intervals closed intervals right? and in in one dimension you can't really think of much variations from there right the other, you can probably think of union of union of intervals and things like that but they are not very natural kind of queries even if it is union of intervals we know we know exactly how to merge them etc you know those things we can handle easy rather easily but the moment you go to higher dimensions, right? So those you know, Cantor sets and things like that are, are, are sort of way out of you know what what uh, people would 
like to query. I mean, the, the querying sets. Um, see, here we are trying to specify, yeah, those are, those are implicit kind of queries. You know, here we are talking about explicit ranges, and I am I'm, I'm actually uh, presenting the description of a range in some way explicitly. Okay. So, in, in, in that context, you know, you, you, there is not a whole lot of variation you can think of, or there is, I mean, natural problems are not going to sort of deviate much outside of that. You know. What kind of, maybe you can think about open intervals or closed intervals, something like that. Maybe union of some finite number of intervals, perhaps but not too much beyond that. Anything beyond that, you know, just becomes, as, as someone said, you know, it, it can be described mathematically, but probably not that useful in, in real life. But the moment you go to higher dimensions, okay, your ranges could take arbitrary shapes and forms, right. So, uh, the, 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 the generalization of the interval range query would be the Cartesian product, right. So, that is the, uh, that is the rectangular range query. So, one is that rectangular range query and not only rectangular, but uh, orthogonal, right. So, it is basically Cartesian product of one dimension, okay. but then it can be have any other kinds of shapes. So, one the rectangular range query need not be orthogonal, you know it may be aligned. Okay. So, aligned rectangles Okay. Other kind of natural queries are, uh, you know, circular range queries. And that is very natural. What, what is it? Basically, I am presenting a ball, okay. There is a ball of radius r centered at, you know, some c. Okay. What are the points in the inside the ball? And that is something very natural, you know. I am I am I am located somewhere and I want to know exactly how many points occur within distance r from there. Okay. So that is your circular range query. If you want to handle arbitrary shapes, okay, um, well at least uh, if you keep it linear boundaries, uh, then it could be a simple polygonal query, right? You know. Uh, If someone is interested for some reason to know how many points are inside this, there will be how many points are outside this. Right? Now, this actually does not go well with our earlier model, where we are saying that we could test whether a point is inside or outside a range in constant time. I mean, if I, if I, if I give you a simple polygon, okay. Uh, to test whether a point is inside or outside a simple polygon, you know, it may take you more than constant time. Um, so, what kind of, suppose it is a simple polygon and you want to test whether the point is inside or outside and you are allowed to build a data structure, how quickly can you answer it? Constant time does not seem to be, because it is completely independent on the size of the polygon. That is an unnatural or an unlikely answer. So, what is the minimum time you can think of? Yeah, so it's kind of a ray shooting query will help it. So if I could build a ray, ray shooting and data structure on 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 a simple polygon, and that will be log n, okay. But it's not constant time. So so it's if it is not constant time, you may actually want to modify this polygonal range query in terms of. You may want to actually uh, decompose the simple polygon into un, union of triangles or something, okay. So you can think about this polygon as. Uh, you know, I triangulate this polygon. Okay, and if I can actually answer, uh, if I can actually answer uh, a triangular range query, then I can just union these triangles and get the final answer, right? So the union of triangular range query. will yield the answer. Okay. Again, there are some mathematical possibilities where this is a simple union okay, and this is uh, sometimes also where I am actually, I am going to only add up. Okay. 
sometimes simple addition don't work okay depending on what kind of problem we are handling so here we are handling points and you know simple polygons or ranges so you can actually generalize the whole range query problems you know not to be just points but could be any kind of objects okay and then you know this simple kind of addition or unions is not going to work okay then one you know one one that there is a <coughs> natural generalization which uses some kind of operator okay operator to combine the answers of these triangles okay but i don't want to get into that right now let's not get get into too much of generalization and these operators are usually so i'll just mention this okay and this uh, perhaps you know you know little later in the course i think professor agarwal will talk about what is called um non orthogonal range queries so we are going to mostly focus on orthogonal range queries so he so there are some ways by which you can combine <coughs> the results of the individual triangles using some usually these operators are called semi group operators and just to give you just one example suppose you know in, in even in the simple one dimensional case okay these points had some kind of uh, it's not a single dimensional pro problem really you know uh, so these are points and they have some attributes maybe which is like some kind of height okay so this is some height this is some height so on and so forth maybe it's some it's some function basically some discrete function okay and i give you a query where yes it's a it's a interval query tell me the highest y axis in this interval so of course in this interval there are only these points so that's that's the first job is to find out which points are we talking about which points are in consideration okay and after that i am going to do some kind of a max of the y coordinates of the points in the range so this max is an operator okay i am not this is not a two dimensional problem where i am saying that you know uh, these are these two these are these points and i give me all the points that occur within this rectangle this problem and this problem they are not the same so this is actually a one dimensional range query problem okay where there is an operator underlying operator which is a max operator okay and semi group basically means associative operator so uh, so it's it's this this operator uh, will also act on the result of the range query and that's how we'll get the final answer so this is a more this is also a range query problem but it's a more complex range query problem and you can really sort of build very complex range query problems from more more and more general definitions right. okay so i'll just leave it at this and let's proceed with the two dimensional case okay that's the immediate problem at hand the axis is yeah, parallel to the axis what is the line line would be you know the it may not be parallel well um, i just called it that <laughs> so i'm calling it orthogonal i'm calling it you know right uh, aligned at any angle basically okay so uh, let's look at the two dimensional problem and the first solution that we'll examine in the two dimensional case you know actually comes from a very general principle okay so let me first talk about the general principle okay and then we'll see that it kind of falls out immediately from a general principle so when you have these points <coughs> one way that we can do some pre processing is kind of cluster these points okay this let's let's so clustering is a very vague term okay so i deliberately want to keep it vague okay some way we are going to sort of uh you know um, partition or cluster these points so maybe so i'm just drawing some arbitrary clusters okay right? maybe this is one way okay. 
So these clusters are not too bad in the sense that you know they are fairly sort of convex kind of regions, but it need not be. So in some way we have grouped or clustered these points, right? And then my range, the range query, the the kind of subsets that I am dealing with, you know, let us say also has some kind kind of arbitrary shape. You know, perhaps it's a triangle. Let's say because triangle is a very, you know, could be any. It can be aligned in any way. So suppose here is my query range. This is my query. So I have built data structure where I have a description of these clusters. Okay. So I have some description of these clusters. And usually again the description will be let us say some order one kind of description. These are like some maybe some rectangular clusters or some circular clusters, whatever. Some some groupings which can be defined easily. It is not a very complicated shape or which will require uh, which have a large descriptive complexity. So they have some simple description, these sets of points, and then I am given this query triangle. So one simple observation is the following that Okay, let me have another another set of points here. So let me make these observations rather simple, but you know will be quite useful later on. So let's call this region one, region two region 3, region 4, region 5, 6, region 7. Okay. So, what I can claim is the following that we need not examine R 7. Can you tell me why? Exactly. So, this region or the description of the region that I have, suppose I have a way to figure out does this query triangle intersect with R7. I am not asking individually all the points, I am asking the question about R7 and not the points inside R7, right. So, R7 can contain many points. I could simply ask is any of the points in R7 contained in this query triangle, okay and I can test them individually, but I do not have to. I can simply find out because this R 7, this entire region R 7 does not intersect with the query triangle, I can conclude that I did not look any further, right, because R 7 intersection the range is empty. So, there can be many such regions, R 6 also is another such region that you know it does not have any intersection with the query triangle. The second kind of course is the is the other direction, right. All points in R3 should be reported. Why? It is completely, it's completely you know, it is it lies inside this, this range, right? Because R3 intersection this is R3, okay. So, these are the two extreme cases and what can you say about the rest? We really do not know, I mean uh, uh, the query triangle intersects R1, R2, R5 uh, and R4, okay. But I have no idea how many points inside R4 or R2 or R1 because I only know about the description of this region, I do not know how the points are distributed inside, I, I have not kept track of that or it is very difficult to. Okay. So, based on this information, I have to look further or examine how many points in R1 and uh, R5 and R2 and R4 are contained inside the query triangle. Okay. For the remaining, we need to examine further. whatever it means. Okay. And whatever it means, 
what is the natural way of sort of doing this, taking it further. Right. So again, R1 is a set of points, R2 is a set of points, and I will I am going to again do the same thing within these regions, right. So maybe I will just have some more clusters here, okay, and so on. So, so now I am going to my final answer is going to be uh, the union of the 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 range query of this triangle with R1, again R2, R5, and R4. So, I have branched out now, right. Unfortunately, now this whole thing, suppose I call this entire thing the set of points as R, okay. So, R, the range query to R is the regions that completely lie inside that is taken care of at the first level itself, the regions that do not intersect that is also taken care of, but recursively we need to handle all the regions that partially have some partial overlap with, with this, right. So, it becomes union of R 1 in this particular case R 1, R 2, R 5 and R 4, which actually is, is not good news, right. Because if you want to write any kind of recurrence relation for the query time or whatever, then from a single point you have you could have you know a four way branching and things like that. And if you have four way branching or five way branching who knows you know the whole thing is not may not turn out to be very efficient. After all, what do we want? Our goal is to report in time proportional to a fixed logarithmic term or a polylogarithmic term plus the number of output points. But you know any kind of recurrence where you have so many branches is unlikely to be very efficient. Okay. So, that is why we have to be careful when we define this partition. Okay. So, this is a very general approach to um, range query that given the set of points you would like to partition them in a certain way and then the query will be answered as union of which which uh, which uh, partitions this query triangle or whatever the query is the range has non trivial intersection with if it fully overlaps no problems it doesn't overlap at all no problems but partial overlaps are the ones which have to be recursively sort of uh, handled so, we will basically in two dimension, we will we'll look at a special way of defining this partition. So, this is, this is a very arbitrary partitioning at this point okay, and that is where I could have a four way, five way, who knows how many ways I have to recursively look for. So, I want to somehow bound you know the number of branches that I am going to have. Okay. So, any suggestions or any ideas, how should we branch? or how should we partition these points and we are handling orthogonal range queries okay these are not arbitrarily aligned rectangles you know the solution okay fine so uh, thanks for confessing but you know if no one else answers i'll let you answer Yeah, it'd be some kind of binary search. You know, binary search is a very, you know, uh, what should I say, ubiquitous term. You know, so there are many ways that you can do binary search. Okay. So what are we partitioning on then? Half half. In what in what direction? Half half is a good idea. Half half basically means that your data structure, the the depth of the data structure is going to be sort of logarithmic, right? Half half. Half half is a good thing. Yeah. So how would you how would you uh, partition those points? Yeah, hierarchically fine, but th that is what we said, you know, we, are, we already discussed that you know, we are going to recursively partition further, but let us say at the top level how are you going to partition. We are handling only rectangle range queries, huh? uh, what is query triangle, no I am not handling query triangles, I am I mean although I gave the example as a triangle because it works for any kind of ranges, but we are going to looking at only for schemes for rectangular range query, orthogonal range query. Okay, take the median along y or x, okay, does not matter, okay, let us take x first. Okay. So, we have uh, I had an example, is this visible? Hmm? 
can't no okay i'll draw it then but the basic idea is clear right so i am going to um, okay let's uh, is it visible let's see let's put it is it visible now better there's a glare okay fine i'll do it i'm just being lazy so i'll do it not that i need this exact point set but it was just P fifteen, P sixteen. So there are sixteen points here. Okay. So as all of you agree, we should try to find a median. There are sixteen points. So well, the numbering of the points was such that you know it was like this. So I partition. So my first level of partitioning is this. I draw the median along the x coordinates. Okay. What should be my next? Let's see. Okay, so someone already is saying, you know, so let us not be partial towards one coordinate. Okay, let's also treat the other coordinate fairly. So this is x coordinate. Now, how should we partition it? Should we uh, just draw? You know, there are a couple of ways. So I have these sixteen points, and I could actually draw a y, so that you know I balance out the number of points above and below. We want to do it that way. That's one option. What's the other option? Yeah, so I treat these separately. Okay, so this set of points and these set of points will be treated separately because this is one partition, it's another partition. Now I recursively partition this and recursively partition this, but then now I use the y to partition, the median of the y to partition, but then they are handled separately. So there are eight points here. So on the left side, you no know, one, two, three. Well, I don't know which one, four. Okay, maybe this one. So this looks like a separator in the y direction for the left sub problem and for the right sub problem maybe this one okay so you can see that you know these two lines you know they are not the same lines you know so they are not flush they are not necessarily flush because we actually partition them separately right now what do we do after this okay now we we treat so now i have this uh, one set of points Second set of points, third set of points, fourth set of points, and we are back to the original problem. And again, within this each of this partition, I can do the, you know, the x y partition again. I, I, I basically recurse like this. Okay, so that's what I do. Uh, what happens when I get a query rectangle? Right. When I get a query rectangle. Well, I mean, I could be lucky, and I could get a rectangle like this, which means that. So, how how is the search tree built? Okay, let's let's first look at that. How is the search tree built? The search tree is built initially. You know, there should be some node of the tree that corresponds to the entire space, the entire point set. Okay, so this corresponds to the entire point set. Then we partition along the x-axis. Okay. So I create two nodes, okay, corresponding to the left half and the right half. Okay, so this represents the left half of the point. This represents the right half of the points. Then within each of these halves, left and right half, I have the up and down 
right. So, this is again the up down and up down okay. and at this point we are basically back to the original problem that again we can repeat the same thing. So, in two levels after two levels basically again we do the left right up down left right up down. So, alternately we do the x and y axis right and eventually when we have only one point we do not need to do anything right. Every every time we are we are partitioning or we, we branch to a left uh, right, right child you know, we are reducing the number of points and this process cannot continue for too long because every time we are having the number of points the depth of this tree is only logarithmic okay and finally each leaf node is going to be associated with only one point okay. now what do we do for these intermediate nodes that we'll see later whether we are going to store all the points here or we don't need to that is something we'll find out later okay but we, what we need to certainly do is that with each of these nodes we need to store the description of the region associated with that. So, the initial node must you know we can enclose all the points in a rectangle huge rectangle. So, it will con uh, contain the description of that rectangle this and this will contain the description of the left half the left rectangle and the right rectangle which is a constant time description uh, constant uh, size description ok. So, each node is associated with some some rectangular region. Okay. And because we have actually made an, we have enclosed everything in the box, every node will basically be a bounded rectangular region, right. So, every node, every node of this tree, every node corresponds to a rectangular region. And that is what makes life easy for us that any time we get a rectangular range query. I can quickly find out whether or not it has any partial overlap, no overlap or complete overlap because these are all my rectangle also constant description, my nodes are also constant description. So, I can quickly determine whether it is a full overlap, partial overlap or no overlap. So, I can make that, that those tests are constant time tests right. Eventually in the leaf node we will have these points stored we will see whether or not we need to also store these points in nodes may or may not depends on you know what the algorithm is going to be like. At this point we get a rectangle ok. So, I, I compare the rectangle with the region of the left well it does not overlap. So, I, I do not need to proceed along this at all ok. So, this rectangle does not proceed along this at all it completely lies to the right of the median line. So, the search path it takes is here next level unfortunately we are not so lucky because it intersects both the up and down ok. So, we need to the search path is like this and then it actually branches to both sides gone. So, maybe you have lost all the advantage because what happens if you keep branching on both sides ok eventually you know that at the leaf level we will have to deal with about order n nodes ok. Order n, so, at every internal node we need to do a constant time check right whether it is partial overlap, full overlap or no overlap right. Now, if this kind of branching continues you know let us say up to all, all the levels almost all the levels then what do you have suppose it, it has branching uh, you know uh, all the way up to the leaf level minus 1 then what happens every time it is a branch of 2. So, every time it is 2 times 2 you know let us say about log n minus 2 times how much is this? Yeah, it is almost yeah n by 4 ok which means that we have lost you know whatever we are aiming for in terms of uh, saving query time in, it does not you know gone. Mm, well these are claims that you are making you know I, I am not convinced about it we will have to analyze it what I am saying is well I mean interval trees are interval trees ok this is not an interval tree this is by the way called a range search tree. Okay. It is a range search tree and it is a very special kind of a range search tree which is called in the literature is called as a KD tree. Why is it called a KD tree? The D it stands for dimension and the K stands for the number of dimensions. Okay. So, in this particular case what I have drawn is essentially a 2D tree. In K dimensions you are going to cycle through these coordinates. So, all the K coordinates. So, here we cycle through first partition along x and then y 
in when you have this k coordinates, then you are going to cycle through all the k coordinates, then go back to the original problem. Okay. Again, partition along the first coordinate, the second coordinate, all the k coordinates. Okay. So, it is called the KD tree in general, it is a very, very common and powerful data structure, okay. but this is the basis of it essentially that you are partitioning the points, you know you have a range and it is going to uh, you know you are going to build a search tree based on that and you are going to you know fork or you know, follow certain search paths depending on which of these nodes this rectangle intercepts with. Okay. So, the, the real question here to analyze is of course, what is the space? Each node occupies only constant space because the region description is constant, okay. but depending on whether or not I store the points also. I do not know. If I store the points also, then at every level I will store a point, then it will be n log n. So, I would say maximum n log n depending on what kind of storage scheme we use, but then it may also be order n, you know, if you are lucky. So, with that we will have to figure out, okay, this is a space. More challenging is the query time and what is the query time really? The query time is the number of internal nodes visited by the search, the recursive search. That is precisely the time of query and finally, when you leave the, reach the leaf nodes, we just either report the point or do not report the point. So, in terms of the output size, it is either going to report or not report. So, you are going to charge one for the reporting and not charge for the not reporting. So, the plus output size kind of falls immediately from here, but number of nodes visited is the is the fixed term. So, how large is this term? What is your guess? Tell me. First, we will first look and see you know if you can guess it and then we will try to if you have guessed it correctly, we will try to analyze it. Log. Two log, log n. Log n. Wow. Okay. Any more guesses? more complicated functions, less complicated functions, no one thinks it is constant, good, okay. because at least the search path will be taking at least one path, right? so that is minimum of log n. Anyone willing to guess log star n? No, log star n is too, n is too small, okay. so 2 to the power log star n, no. So, since we are running out of time, what I will do is I will give you the answer, let you think about it overnight and tomorrow I will complete the proof. Okay. Some of you should know because you have done some course with me where I think I may have discussed this. Okay. Okay, last chance. Log 3 by 2, <laughs> still, still stuck with logs. N, yeah, N is certainly an upper bound for sure. It cannot visit more than n nodes. N log, no, n log n is way over. You know. will be penalized for that answer. Yeah, I heard it. I heard it. Yes, root n. Got it. So, you may think that root n is, I mean, the reason maybe you did not try to guess root n is because it is not consistent with our goals of polylog. Okay. But there is a catch that I'll 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 uh, explain tomorrow. So it turns out that the space is order n that I don't need to store points in any of the intermediate nodes, okay? And I'll be able to analyze where I'll show that the number of nodes visited is no more than square root of n, okay? By any rectangle, it, uh, any rectangular range, and this is almost the best possible, okay? What that is the surprising part. The surprising part is surprising news is that if we use order n space query time, one can show a lower bound of square root of n. This is a very you know, rather unexpected result actually and it is very difficult to prove, we will not even attempt, we will not attempt to prove it, but this is known. So, if we restrict ourselves to linear space, okay, we are bound to encounter in the worst cases about square root of n. Right? All right.